The abacus was man's second aid to counting. The first was his ten fingers. In their first month at school, these six-year-olds learn a system of arithmetic utterly strange to their parents. Before they leave school, this new approach to mathematics will widen to prepare them for the computer, the new machine which promises or threatens the mind with what the Industrial Revolution did to the muscles. This week, Four Corners asks, when this circuit learns your job, what are you going to do? The computer age in Australia is now. It's 10 years old, and in 10 years there have been three computer generations. From the first giant machines homemade in universities and filling rooms with radio valves and wiring, to the new models, many times smaller, many times cheaper, and a thousand times more efficient. In 10 years, the computer has spread from the university research centres into government and business. There are now 600 in Australia. They'll double in number in the next three years and increase fourfold in the next 10 their influence will grow even faster. In their metal boxes of salmon pink, beige or deep blue, trimmed in stainless steel or aluminium, the circuits work quietly at immeasurable speed. Computers fracture time into millionths of a second, nanoseconds, the time taken for a calculation. The human operator is one bottleneck, another is translation of the machine's work into language we can understand. Into the computer's prodigious memory systems are fed facts for calculations. The computer cannot create, it can only process, and its results are only as good as the facts given to it. Everything is expressed in mathematical terms. To a computer, a man is a number, a pattern of holes in a punch card, a recorded symbol on magnetic tape or disk. Already, often unknowingly, most people have dealings with computers. The old man's fortnightly pension check is made out by a computer-controlled machine. Soon, all social service payments will churn out from machines in the Commonwealth Government's money factories at 30,000 checks an hour. Paychecks, taxation checks, licenses and bills, the computer can calculate them all. Melbourne where everyone who bets on the TAB deals with a computer. Two computers handle the Victorian TAB operations. One does the work, the other is on standby. A stock exchange computer system on the blink in Sydney can inconvenience brokers and investors. A failure here could cause a punter's riot. It's the only racing installation of its kind in the world, and it took 25 man years to teach it the mathematics of the turf. Whatever the race result, the computer pays its own dividend. It does the work of 700 clerks, and will pay for itself in a very few years. Eventually, telephone lines will link most Victorian TAB agencies to the computer. Telephone account bettors are already doing business with it, but through an operator. Now, to have a balance of $7.30, um, 
Well, now I'll have four. Number four, hand two. And nine. And nine, Leviathan. Yes, with uh, the second leg. Race results are typed in as they come from the course. Instantly, dividends are computed, agencies miles away notified. Winning accounts are credited and the losers charged. The process starts again for the next race on any course the TAB covers. Another race, the space race. And here too, the computer is a starter. In a quiet farmland valley near Canberra, a computer controls the great dish, which listens to transmissions from orbiting spacecraft. While one computer keeps the dish moving at the right speed, others receive and process the spacecraft's information and send it on direct to another computer in Houston, Texas. Science, business and government have created such a demand for computer experts that there are not enough to go around. Apart from staff training in computer houses and university courses which concentrate on scientific rather than commercial computing, little training has been available. This is changing. High school students in South Australia began learning computing this year in an experiment started by Professor John Ovenston of the University of Adelaide. Professor Ovenston favours an early start to computer learning. As early as possible, but certainly not before about 12 to 14. I don't think they've got enough logical thought or connected logical thought to do much about it before then. There are exceptions, but in general, uh, I think it would be unfair to put a child in before about 12 to 14. Do you regard it as necessary that children of this age, in their early teens, should learn about these things now? Well, the techniques are equally well applicable to French or German or um, social studies as they are to computer work. And the techniques they learn in, in uh, computer programming are applicable right throughout the rest of their study. And if we just give them this basic training, uh, they have something that they would not have otherwise. I think we've got to remember that um, we're faced in Australia with a peculiar sort of politico-economic situation where if we don't educate our people so that they can use computers properly that our standards of living will have to drop. We're faced with the situation, there's no way out of it. There are one or two commercial schools for would-be computer experts. This is the Hemingway Robertson Institute in Sydney where teaching starts with the computer approach to basic mathematics. Now, our numbering system generally, our numbering systems everywhere are a ghastly mess. We get our measurements, our inches, because somebody had a long thumb. Um, our mile is a thousand double paces of the Roman legion. And um, our foot is the distance between some English king's elbow and his wrist. So consequently, we have a large number of peculiar numbering systems. But binary is a logical number system. The lecturer, Frank Linton Simpkins, says computing is the new glamour industry. A lot of people want to be in it. But how many of the hopefuls will make the grade? I should imagine it's probably only about a third. Um, I think, um, well, this is my own personal view. You must realize this. I'd say about one third will make it. What is it that decides success or failure? It's an indefinable ability. The, psychi the psychologists feel that they can measure it. Um, I'm not so sure. I think that they can measure the top, say, 15%, and certainly those ones will be a success. And they can measure the bottom 15%, and they know they won't be a success. But there's a great mass of people in between, which, as yet, I don't really think you can measure. You can say that somebody is likely to be good, but as yet, there's no accurate measure, there's no final test as to what the person's going to be, no prediction, until they actually get into the industry and then you can see, see what they do, and that's it. Is there an age bar to learning computers? Definitely. There's a definite age bar. Um, there's no hope in the world for somebody past the age of 35, unless he's already employed by some company uh, that installs a computer and then swaps him over. Somebody just coming into the business, um, from scratch, wanting to just sort of branch out and become a computer programmer or a systems analyst, I think there's little chance of him getting a job, being given a trainee job past the age of 35. In fact, now, if you look at the ads, most ads st state this quite categorically. Uh, not in the far distant future is the total destruction of the uh, position or profession of clerk. Um, uh, most clerks and offices are 
practically unskilled laborers who can read and write. And this is about it. Their jobs are in danger, and they have about five years to run, at the most. While the arbitration court is considering a test case involving replacement of people by computers, the Council of Salaried and Professional Associations sees other fears. Its Victorian Secretary, Mr John Sanders. Well, our principal concern is that uh, computers shall not be used to reorganise the lives of people, to change their working lives altogether, but that uh, computers should be tools in the hands of the people. They should be uh, supplying their needs and are not changing their lives. But have your members any more to lose than the regularity of nine to five hours? Well, we feel that um, social patterns of living in the, in the nine to five area are long established and that interference with these patterns, uh, where it's more than uh, really enforced by the requirements of industry, it's not necessary that the, the concerns of people should come before the concerns of the machines. Does this disorganisation of established ways of life concern you more than a possible loss of work altogether for people as a result of computers? Well, no, but I would say that uh, the possible loss of work altogether is quite a long way in the future in the Australian scene. Uh, in certain overseas countries, in the United States, for instance, it's been formulated that possibly by the year 1980 only 10% of the present workforce would be required to maintain the output of goods and services for the community but in a developing country like Australia this is much further ahead I would say. Can you see banking becoming in the future a totally automated industry? I think this is very unlikely. I think the uh, personal service type industries will only be uh, susceptible to uh, computerization in a certain area and beyond that the personal service will uh, still be paramount. But the banks have taken enthusiastically to computers. At 30 miles an hour, checks flash through this computer-controlled machine at the Bank of New South Wales in Sydney, the first and biggest banking computer in Australia. Much of the checking work of 100 suburban branches is done here. The machines and their computer master scan, check, sort and enter 600 checks a minute. Banking is a rich field for computer makers, but overseas the designers are thinking now of business without checks at all. Instead, a national credit card system, computer operated. The quiet dignity of the banking chamber has long been the stronghold of the white-collar worker. But for how long? Computer makers, of course, are very keen to sell their product. And uh, in my view, uh, they tend to sell computers into areas where they're not really required. And of course, purchases fall in to some degree with the companies for the sake of keeping up with the Joneses. It's uh, an image building device to have a computer in your company. Good morning, gentlemen. <laughs> I'd like to welcome uh, two visitors to our meeting this morning, our uh, regional marketing director, Mr. Art Cap, and our manager of education, Greg Dunn. Uh, uh, Art graces us with his presence uh, every so often, and I want to take advantage of uh, his presence this morning by asking him to do some work uh, to present the Salesman of the Week Award. Thanks, Art. Thank you, the weekly salesman's meeting at IBM giant of the computer business. Well, everybody knows that a salesman is a man who sells by definition. But in IBM, as you are well aware, our installing activity is equally important. And this week, we're recognizing as the salesman of the week, Peter Benjamin, for an outstanding job of installing a Model 30 in one of his insurance customers. Peter, would you come up and be recognized? Thanks, Al. Thank you. Can you tell us a little about it? Well, it's, uh, it's been a very interesting uh, challenge. Uh, These are among the best paid salesmen in Australia. They can make $12,000 or more a year, and this, rather than the prize pewter pots, breeds their enthusiasm for the industry, the company, the machines. Some are university graduates. All are computer experts. In the computer business, salesmen are the elite. There are no unsuccessful salesmen. If at first they don't succeed, the prospects aren't too good. 
Get your thinking caps on. Peter, would you like to start the ball rolling? Um, 4,000 this week. 4,000 points? Yeah. Look good? I see, I've got some paperwork. Most of IBM's computer business is the leasing of machines, but lease or sale, one dollar of business is one competitive point for a salesman. I know very well you had a thousand points on the sheet last week. Well, that still depends very much on a board meeting later on this week, but the um, board meeting's Thursday. The board meeting is this week. Uh -huh. Thursday, right. Comes through on Thursday, well, we may be able to get through the week. Yeah. Well, how many points in it? A thousand points. That's as safe as a bank. Peter. Well, myself, I've got 5,400, Ken. Uh-huh, uh-huh. This week? <clears throat> yes, the whole project's been on schedule so far. There's no reason why it'll slip now. Well, that's a good sign, okay. Anybody total that up? I think that's uh, 27,700. Yeah. Okay, and it looks like with the sound business, it's in the range of about... Uh, Oh, 15 to that, depending on this swinger. Well, Mr. Cap, uh, are you satisfied with that forecast? Well, that's far and away the most enthusiastic forecast and the healthiest one I've seen this year. <laughs> <laughs> of all the branch offices, I'll make you a special proposition. If you can achieve, let's see, 20,000 points of that forecast, I'll take you all out to dinner after the next sales meeting. How about that? <laughs> Outside fly the flags of Australia and Britain, but inside IBM, it's big business, American style. Arthur Cap is marketing director for Australia. After watching a meeting of your salesmen, I feel that there's almost a military air about your operations in the selling field. Would you agree with this? Well, I wouldn't call it a military air, but it certainly does require a, a good bit of discipline in a highly specialty oriented selling force as ours. Uh, we must bring them together periodically to review the basic fundamentals of not only the equipment that we market, but also the techniques of selling themselves. And that's the purpose of the sales meeting. It may appear to be military because we have to do quite a bit in a very short period of time. There's also a uniformity amongst the men themselves. <laughs> uh, I'd like to think that that's by sheer chance, but uh, we do, as I, as I said, have a pretty high degree of discipline in the organization. Uh, we begin by recruiting people that we think will represent the company well with senior executives. And when we have very young men calling on very senior executives, uh, we're looking for, I suppose, a degree of standardization in the people. Sometimes it's suggested that computers have been oversold in Australia in recent years, and that because of overselling, they're being used in wasteful applications. Uh, there's a tendency when a new product is announced for the sales representatives to overstate the case uh, to some extent. Uh, that's, I think, the natural enthusiasm of the true salesman expressing itself. Hi, Mr. Hanley. Well, having seen the rest of the system, let me now introduce you to the 2260. A few points firstly on the physical box itself, Mr. Hanley. You notice it's quite a small, compact, neat little unit. It's, um, it's a very low rental unit. It's a unit which we can have many of in a company, and we can have them not, as you see it here, Mr. Hanley, directly in location to the the IBM makes seven out of every ten computers sold in the world, four of every ten sold in Australia. The industry calls IBM Snow White. Competitors are the seven dwarfs. All watch with more than casual interest the moves of the growing and independent Japanese computer industry. Its plans to begin marketing computers in Australia this year could provide the wicked witch in the story of an industry which so far has been pleasant and enormously profitable. Right, we push shift and enter, and there we have the policy number, good. the address, uh -huh. and there we have it. Australia has no share yet in computer manufacturing, but in a small workshop factory in Sydney, one company is moving towards limited local manufacture. Electronic Associates Incorporated is an offshoot of an American parent company, but its design for an analog computer is wholly Australian. The computer is intended mainly for teaching. It can also be used in some engineering applications, such as the design of a motorcar suspension system. 
At around $1,200, it will be the smallest and by far the cheapest computer sold in Australia when production starts about the middle of this year. The workshop expects to build one a week and hopes for enough orders to keep going for four years. Three quarters of the parts used in the prototype are made in Australia. This proportion could rise later this year when a Melbourne manufacturer begins production of computer circuit parts. At Croydon, on the outskirts of Melbourne, the American electronics manufacturer Fairchild has a branch factory. It assembles transistors for the Australian electronics industry and for export. Fairchild plans to begin production this year of micro-miniature circuits, the tiny electronic devices which have made possible the compact third-generation computers. The specs are transistors. Each can do the job of a valve, and each spec has to be soldered joined to wires and leads. Market prospects are good. A computer system may contain more than a million of these tiny parts. Australia has the design knowledge and manufacturing know-how to make computers. One of the first stored memory computers in the world was built here 20 years ago. But the market is too small and the development capital needed for computer design is lacking. The industry continues to import complete machines from overseas, matching together in this one installation components made in four other countries. Computer research in Australia mostly aims at finding new uses, new techniques of operation. One university is working on what it calls a hierarchical computer which can control others. Another research effort aims to establish communication between a number of computers. Yet another seeks human voice control of a computer system. With an electric pen, a designer draws in three dimensions on an electronic screen. On this computer controlled device, he can design a house, a motor car or a bridge and before a nail is driven or a foundation dug, the computer will supply material quantities, calculations of stress and strain, and an intriguing picture of how the structure will look from all possible and impossible angles. translation of thought to reality is one of the computer's contributions to science. The only limit seems to be the inventiveness of the man controlling the machine. This is a war game. The aeroplane has two bombs, the ship two missiles.
Beautiful. <laughs> This is more than an expensive parlor game. It's a test of the capability of the computer and the university programmer who devised the game. <laughs> After that, it's almost disappointing to find that the defense department, which plays the war game in earnest, uses its big Canberra computers only for military housekeeping. Here, as elsewhere in the Commonwealth's computer activities, the machines have forced a revision of public service thinking. Men have had their promotion prospects cut short. They've been moved to other departments. Young computer men have achieved rank and salary which older officers might have worked a lifetime to reach. Nearly two-thirds of trained computer men work for government in Australia. This is one reason for the shortage of experienced people. Although not without its teething troubles, computing came at the right time for the Defence Department. The tasks of controlling stores had become too much for men to handle. In one military aeroplane, there are three quarters of a million parts. Civil aviation, with similar problems, has also found new uses for computers. TAA's trainer, call sign Tango Sierra Bravo, a jet flight to nowhere. The flight simulator and its control computer cost a million and a quarter dollars, but it's cheap training for pilots and doesn't tie up an aeroplane that could be carrying passengers. If things go wrong, the flight can be halted temporarily until they're put right. The pilots who use it regard it often as harder than an actual flight. The airline's training captain, okay, Jim, Frank we've Fisher. We've arrived at 10,000 feet and I've engaged the automatic pilot. Now, this whole device has been controlled by the computer in the room you saw out there. This whole device, again, is an exact replica of the 727 cockpit, and everything is controlled in it by a computer, and everything reacts here exactly the same as it does in the aeroplane. What about emergency procedures? Well, that's a big advantage of this device. We can simulate all sorts of emergencies. For instance, we can simulate an engine on fire in flight. Lou, can we have number one engine on fire, please? Number one. We can silence the bell and the pilot is required to stop the engine, pull the fire warning, select it, press the button, discharges fluid or gas into the engine. Now the fire should go out. You can see the fire has gone out. That's exactly what would happen in the aeroplane, exactly what the pilot is required to do. The reaction to this device with the computer is exactly the same as the aircraft. Captain, can you see computer-controlled flight in the future? No, not really. I can see computer control of air traffic, but I don't believe in the foreseeable future you can have computer control of an aeroplane in, in flight. The actual control of the aeroplane, no, I don't. Already, some international airline bookings are made by computer. The supersonic Concorde aeroplanes, which Qantas has on tentative order, will carry a computer programmed to control the flight, perhaps even the automatic landing. Certainly, as aeroplanes get bigger and faster, and their flights more numerous, air traffic will demand a degree of computer control. Another kind of traffic is practically beyond human control. 
Computers are at work on Sydney's traffic, measuring, analysing and looking for solutions to the problem of a choking city. The computer can say where a road should be built and how it can be built. It can draw the road in detail, a full design for an expressway at the rate of one mile an hour. The engineering uses of computers are endless. Change the program, add some accessories, and the computer can control a steel mill, regulate a power station, or mastermind the automation of half our manufacturing industry. It can help to design other, better computers. This electronic Ouija board draws a contour map of a tin mine a thousand miles away, working from surveyor's figures. With similar data, it could design a railway line, a harbour, an aerodrome, or a superhighway. that will make these roads inadequate in a few years are probably being computer designed now. It's hard to see the computer as a mercy machine, but computers can save lives. Some states are financing research projects to adapt computers to work in hospitals. The Victorian Civil Ambulance already has a radio and telephone system for directing patients to hospitals with vacant beds. Some of this work could be computer controlled. Once the patient is in hospital, the computer promises to be a medical and nursing aid of enormous value. A constant watch of the pulse rate and temperature of every seriously ill patient. An alarm system if a patient's condition should suddenly change. And as well, an accounting system to pay the staff and prepare the patient's bills. In Adelaide, a medical program is being designed on the university computer, Professor Ovenston. We have several experiments going in medicine, um, one on cytology where we're trying to uh, examine all the smears from women that come in for cancer smears. Um, we update their files, follow up their treatment and try and analyse the uh, disease cases to see what in fact is causing cancer. Uh, we have another experiment going in uh, medical diagnosis. Uh, this is purely experimental at this stage and so far we've only got 1,365 symptoms for about 95 diseases. And the idea is that the doctor indicates the main symptoms he can observe on the patient. Uh, the machine comes back with an answer saying that if he has these symptoms, I suggest you try to examine this symptom to see that whether or not he's got it. If he has, it will then come back with the disease that he thinks the patient or the machine thinks the patient has. The doctor checks this. If he thinks it's the right disease, in terms of the symptoms he's observed, he can then ask for various treatments. And these treatments will vary from moment to moment and from year to year. No doctor, I'm afraid, neither can any scientist for that matter, stay up to date with all the literature. So all this is is a means of assisting the doctor to determine how sick a patient is and what sort of treatment he should give that particular type of patient. The computer craft keeps not only a wall of plate glass between itself and the world outside, it has encouraged the mystique which still surrounds computing, a mystique with a dollar value. For the fewer the people who know computers, the better the rewards for those in on the ground floor. But the machine makers are trying to break down the barrier of expertise by designing computer systems for direct communication with the people who have problems to solve. This computer costs a million dollars, but its services will be available soon to any user. Its weekly cost, less than the wages of a clerk. The computer gets its work in plain language, simply typed in. The answer comes back the same way, to a teleprinter miles away from the computer center. The only link needed is a telephone line.
Such advancing techniques could eventually affect computer workers themselves and reduce still further the already sparse population of computer rooms. The fewer people visible in a computer installation, the neater, tidier and more efficient the installation is considered. Dr. Barry Thornton is Director of Engineering for Honeywell Australia. His specialty is computer design and development. The operating of machines these days is something that we have almost succeeded in eliminating because the manufacturers provide what we call operating systems and these are provided and fed into the computer quite separately to any program that the user may put in and they look after the entire operating procedure from woe to go and they will take batches of problems rather than just a one-off problem and make much more efficient use of the faster machines that are available than was possible previously and uh, the less intervention by a human operator the better because a human operator is only going to slow things down. So we provide these operating systems as do all organisations in the industry now and uh, the idea of operating it uh, is something that we want to get away from. It seems almost inevitable that because of computers some people are going to lose their jobs. Can the computer industry regard itself as in any way responsible for them? Certainly it is designed to make the businesses more efficient and more profitable, but in making them more efficient and more profitable, it usually makes them capable of further expansion, which requires more people. Uh, some of the people who are doing very menial tasks find that there will be opportunities to do much more interesting tasks if they're able to do it or willing to learn to do it. And in fact, uh, my observation so far on the Australian industry is that the more interesting jobs have been created than jobs eliminated. But the new and more interesting jobs are for other people, aren't they? Under 35 and trained in computers. They are not necessarily for other people, but they are for people who are willing to uh, learn to do the new jobs. And as far as the age is concerned, uh, certainly it is probably harder to learn some of these new things in the computer industry uh, beyond 35 or 40 but uh, it doesn't mean that a man 35 or 40 is out of the business. Computing lecturer Frank Linton Simpkins doesn't like all he sees in the future of man and computer. Well there's two main fears. Uh, the first is a normal one with any radical technological change and this is the <clears throat> replacement of jobs, in fact, the destruction of jobs. Um, this would be, in, in character of its final absurdity, the situation where nobody or people would have not a, would be given a right to work at, say, three hours um, work a week. Um, and uh, I don't quite know what they do with the rest of their time. Perhaps um, we come full cycle and somebody would reintroduce something like the Roman circuses to keep them entertained. This is the uh, uh, this is for the future, but what's dangerous right now, terribly dangerous, is the concept of what's called a national data bank. This is a, an attempt by governments to control information or gather information to one central point about any person in, or people, groups of people in the country. Uh, there are advocates of this national data bank, most of them very honest and sincere men who think that it would be a good thing, and so it would be in certain areas. Um, it would provide information for health details, uh, for surveys. The other thing, and the worst thing about it, is this. That with information about a man's income, his job, his place of residence, his health history, his educational ability, and his taxation history, all at one point, this gives you a terrific, gives a government a terrific control and information about the individual. Uh, in the past, when somebody has um, been accused of gerrymandering an electorate, they've done this uh, without a great deal of knowledge of the individual people. With a computer and a national data bank, they could gerrymander an electorate absolutely. 
so that a malevolent party in power would remain in power legally, indefinitely, by rigging the votes in this way, rigging the electorate. Uh, there is an argument, again, the arguments against me, I'm not exactly the only person who thinks this, this way, but there are others who think quite the opposite. Uh, they think that data banks, national data banks, are a good idea. And they say that there will be built-in controls so that people can't use these or misuse them. The wrong people can't get the information. But in all honesty, just think, a, an idea of this power, would you trust the average politician with this power? I'm afraid I wouldn't. Data bank is an unpopular phrase at the Commonwealth Bureau of Census and Statistics. The Bureau denies absolutely at top level that a plan or even an intention exists for a national data bank. But the idea has been canvassed by some of the Bureau's own computer men. They claim the bank will come inevitably. Computer people go about their business with single-minded purpose to sell, install, operate and control more computers. Change and innovation are ends in themselves and in the search for technological advance, the human goals of technology seem destined to be forgotten. The disciples of the computer can see the prospect that a man's rise to the top may depend on his ability to commune with a machine, to turn computer power to personal power, and not the meek, but the systems analyst shall inherit the earth. With near religious fervor, some promote their machines as the cure for the world's ills, economic liberator of the impoverished, even bringer of international peace, but they don't say how. Outside the computer world, the machines are vaguely feared. Trevor Piercy, president of the Australian Computer Society. Some people fear computers. Do you think there's a sound basis for fear? On the whole, I think not. Most people fear computers largely from the, the promise they have of putting people out of work. But although some people will become redundant, I feel pretty certain that there will always be new things they can do, even if it means a certain amount of retraining. I think the real future lies not in the, so much in the application of computers to automation of industry, but in computers being applied to what are currently semi-intelligent functions of the human brain. And this will leave people to apply their brains to a higher level. Now we shall, in this case, have computers doing the more menial mental services and as these increase, the human mind will be able to expand and keep ahead of them. But is the computer already too far ahead of our ability to cope with it? The Australian and New Zealand Association for the Advancement of Science has warned that no one in Australia has yet paused to consider the social effects of computers. Clearly, computers are economic because they repeal Parkinson's law. Fewer people handle more work. They offer a degree of business stability unknown with human workers, unpredictable, contentious, disruptive people. The computer is the complete servant, or the potential master. The time could be overdue for Australia to take a hard look into the 1970s and ask as a national question, when this circuit learns your job, what are you going to do?